Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Love City Arts podcast and television show. I'm Andre in the Flow. I'm so glad you're here with us this week. On this week's episode, we have Talia Gurdeen. She is a licensed professional therapist out of Chicago, Illinois. She was brought to us by our Board of Governors member, Kim Dacus Wilson, and just we connected these dots on the internet. And here we are. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. Yes, yes. What I, what I loved is when I saw your uplifting statuses and messages in the area of mental health. I was like, this is, we need to connect the artist with a person like you because mental health is so essential in these times. It's always been that way, but sure. especially right now. Yeah. Um, how, how, how are you giving your gift to the world through, through mental health um, practicing? Well, traditional therapy is one of my favorite ways to do so, but I do like to delve off into the more uh, culturally diverse aspects of providing mental health services. Like you said, whether it's an artist or just a person of color, a queer person, we can't all be fit into a box as far as, you know, treatment modalities. And most of the treatments are, are directed toward you know, Caucasians or people that were available to do the, the standardized testing and things like that. So I like to provide diverse services, like very individualized and personalized to the, to the person. That's amazing. That's amazing. You said that you specialize in um, populations that aren't always centered, populations like people of color and queer people. Um, what made you fall in love with that group? Being a part of that group. Okay, that'll do it. <laughs> that'll do it. Being immersed in this population and seeing that the areas of opportunity for growth and just really wanting to be a part of making that change. And then the healer has to heal themselves first. So going through that journey of, you know, addressing my own mental health and just being sure that I'm well and making sure I'm communicating effectively and I don't have any toxic energy around me, just doing that whole cleanse and just being like, you know, I want others like me to experience this as well. Mm -hmm. Tell me, tell me about that cleanse. Tell me about um, that period of, of darkness in your life and then how you work through it. Well, having to connect spiritually, I know before we got started, you and I talked about the importance of spirituality. So really connecting spiritually on a deeper level. Sometimes you have to go deeper than the traditions that were handed to you. Maybe they're not serving you as well anymore. So um, that was a process, just really delving more into how I felt that my higher power saw me and what was wanted for me. And then examining the relationships around me, do they reflect self love that I should have for myself, you know, and mm -hmm. just kind of reevaluating the relationships that I had, including the one with myself. So it was a very, like you said, it's a dark period, but, but seeds become plants in the dark. So it's kind of necessary to go through that. On so like, <laughs> seeds become see. This is exactly why I was I was I was like I gotta have her on the show because seeds do become plants in, in the, the dark. dark. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it's when no one's looking. Like we live in a culture where like everyone's flexing on Instagram and they're totally, um, you know trying to pretend like everything's in the light and in front of the lights and the camera and the action and all that stuff. But a lot of the work happens in, in dark spaces. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And one of my favorite sayings during this period was, you know, my glory, not my story, but it's because we're so immersed, submerged in a culture that does not share our story. We only want to share the glory. And then we wonder why we feel disconnected and why we don't have these deep, connections and intimate relationships with people that we truly desire but it's because of the the culture of social media and things like that that we've succumbed to where yes you're putting your glory out there and not your story granted everyone doesn't deserve the gift of your story but if you are you know available to be able to get that vulnerable and share I believe that you should because someone is listening and someone you're going to help someone with your story because we're all connected but right. social media kind of separates us from that it does. I de what, where do you think that started? Like, do you think that happened at the beginning of Facebook or an Instagram? And I'm not villainizing these platforms because we're sure. using them to spread love and light. But 
Absolutely. We need to become so central to our lives. Yeah. I think that it probably comes from the cultural instinct that we've developed over time to just be better and to compare. And so social media is a great avenue to do that because you don't have to share your failures. You can only share the positive things that have happened to you or, you know, you can throw shade when somebody says something that you don't like without addressing it directly. You can post that new car that you got. You can go on that trip, you know, without really having to connect with people. You're, you're pretty much just showing you know, I have this, I have that. And I think that we were that way before social media, but social media has just made it easier to do. Yeah, it's magnified it. It's yeah. Magnified it. So like, what are some of the tools that you encourage your clients to, to use to go deeper in their spiritual and, and mental health practice? One of them is, like you said, I don't want to villainize social media because there are some really positive aspects about it. People have connected with families. We're connecting right now. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I'll say cleanse your timeline. If you have a bunch of people that are just showboating the things, oh, what's the saying that you said is common in the arts community once you've made it? Oh, the books and bless thing. The books and bless. Books and bless. And it's, all, it's only when, uh, pleased to announce, thrilled to announce that I'm on this stage and that stage. Hashtag books and bless. Yes. That is like something that I see transferred across all professions and all walks of life is the, the idea of since we're doing this for the art community, the book to bless, uh, blessed to be booked. Is that what it is? But uh, it's books and blessed. Basically, I booked the job. And so because I booked the job, I'm blessed. Yeah. So people do that about trips. People do that about, you know, graduating from school. People do that. It's, you know, booked and blessed. Everybody wants to be booked and blessed. So if you're starting to feel overwhelmed and you're starting to feel inadequate as a result of these postings, maybe mute those people until you can go back and maybe it inspires you. But Sometimes, you know, I'm a big believer in energy. If it's not meant to inspire you and you, you kind of feel facetious intent or narcissistic uh, intent from the post, just mute them for a while and then fill your timeline up with things that inspire you. So follow pages that post things that inspire you. If you still, if you can't hang up the social media, then rework it so that it works for you. Mm -hmm. I, I have personally, um, and this is not a flex, this is just my journey for my mental health because I can't, I, I can't have um, trash in the yard, um, you know, and, I, and that's why I'm loving everybody, hallelujah, yes. hallelujah, yes, but, um, but when people tell me that their um, Instagram or their Facebook is making them sad or that they have to take a complete break from it, which I honor, um, because it's just, they've got so much garbage on it. I'm like, who are you following? Because whenever I turn on my Facebook, you're there. You know, whenever I turn on my Instagram, I'm, I'm not getting notification posts or status posts from, you know, from people that are, you know, wanting to dwell in the darkness or the low vibratory energy. Like all of my status notifications are, you know, uh, inspirational quotes or people that are, are like-minded in, in wanting to see the positive and inhabit gratitude in their lives. And so That's the right. algorithm has learned me. The algorithm knows I'm not with the mess. I don't care anything about the Maury show or, um, None it, of that, right. It's, it's being a, uh, a curator of, what's we call it in buddhism the sense gates what's coming in through your eyes and your ears and your yeah right absolutely like everything we consume is not just about food it's about what you're seeing what you're hearing you know instead of scrolling through your facebook timeline and looking at the person who used to bully you in high school get rid of that person mute that person delete that person what mm -hmm. you know why have this person on there just for, you know, so that you get the gratification of seeing what they're doing if what they're doing triggers you, you know, and I say this with love. We've all had to do this where we've had to mute, you know, a page or a person's story because it, like you said, dwells in the negative. And that's okay. That's, that's a huge marker of self-care. Cleanse your space, even if it's yeah. your social media space. And I was going to ask you about that to that end. Um, do you think it's easier to mute people on the internet versus muting them in person? And, and 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, was, I mean, because like, okay, it's it's. Um, I, I'm, 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 this is like a both and situation. I'm not like trying to like play one against the other. Right. Right. You know, it's easy to turn off Susan. You know, on the internet when she's trying you um, in your in your in your DMs or whatever. Mm -hmm. What if Susan is in your office or on stage with you or in your yeah. dressing room? How do we how do we mute? What would be your tools for muting in real life? Mm -hmm. IRL, as the kids say. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> IRL, you may not be able to mute as well. However, you can set boundaries. And that, mm -hmm. I think, is something that's really uncomfortable for people sometimes, is having to set those boundaries. But you absolutely have to and can. And it's, it's just about being assertive. You don't have to be mean. It's just, you know... An example, Susan is bothering you. You're trying to, you know, finish up this script. You guys work in the office. You have to get it done. Susan is doing Susan, Susaning. And you're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> She's Susaning. So you're like, hey, Susan, I really got to get this work done. So um, I'm not able to talk right now. That's a no. That's not a, I'll get back to you when. That's just a no. No mm -hmm. is a complete sentence. Oprah, Oprah said that best. It's a complete sentence. No is a complete sentence. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Boundaries are a thing. And, and I found that people will um, steal from you. They'll take your time. They'll take your energy. They'll take your focus. And then you'll be six, you'll be six weeks, six vampires. Yes. Energy vampires. Just suck yes. And instead of like building their own um, light and love and positivity and purpose, they just want to take. And, and so the ability to say, um, I call it a high quality no, which actually puts a little spin on it. Cause it's like, you know, if I no no, like get out of my right. face. It's no, completely no. different. Yeah. Just no. no, no, just, just no. When did you know that you wanted to be a, uh, licensed practicing Count like li, help like me help professional counselor a therapist yeah, it, basically we're all the when, same. It, when did you know <laughs> I knew actually in high school when I um I did want to do journalism because I've always been a writer like I told you I'm I'm a big fan of the arts I'm a something like an artist myself deep down in there somewhere oh I can't wait to hear more about this one. <laughs> So I was going to do journalism, but my senior year, I took a human behavior class and I was just so enthralled. I had such a good teacher. She was able to cover, you know, this psychology class at the high school level in a way that just drew me in. And then it made me realize I've always thought this way about, you know, what makes people tick? Why do, why do they do the things that they do? Why do I do the things that I do? You know, um, coming to the conclusion that all behavior is purposeful early before I knew that that was an actual thing. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to pause you right there because yeah. that's, that's, I've never, all behavior is purposeful. All of it. All of it. Absolutely. All of it. Tease that out for, for listeners and viewers like me who are, are like, okay, I think I get what you're saying, but purposeful, like, in, like, okay. So, Everyone, one the theory of psychology or practicing counseling with someone is everyone's trying to get a need met in every single thing they do. So, I mean, from the most simplest thing to the most complex of behaviors, I mean, we can even think as, as simple as blinking, you blink for a reason, as complex as what Jesse just did, Jesse Smuggle just did. See, I was wondering if you were to come into the room about this and make this like, <laughs> you know, cutting edge, timely, uh, right. Right. So you're you're, you're um, kind of going in and out a little bit. It paused. Oh. Okay, hold on. Okay. okay, so we'll back up. And um, so, so I was wondering if you were going to talk about Jesse, like like everything from the blink to Jesse. Yeah, it's purposeful. Yeah. How so? Okay, so you know we blink because we we've, we've got to refresh our eyes. They're getting dry. All every single behavior is purposeful. If we we sleep for a reason, even if scientists are not quite sure a hundred percent why we dream or why we sleep, everything is purposeful. Behavior is purposeful as well. I'm not gonna get into the psychology of why Jesse possibly did what he did, but 
people lie, people make up things, people are extroverted for a reason, they're introverted for a reason. Everything we do is for a reason, every single thing. There's nothing that's just pointless. If, if we're procrastinating and we think it's just because we you know, don't wanna do the assignment, it's for a reason. And so, and so you help your clients and want to help the world go deeper into the why of the why of the why. Right, because we often like are most comfortable expressing anger or you know dis discontentment or disappointment with something, but there's usually something that's just a that's just a surface level emotion. It's usually a reason why it's, it's sadness or it's hurt or it's mm -hmm. neglect or feeling fear of abandonment, feeling abandoned. It's always something, and and on the positive side too. When people exude love, they're able to do that for a purpose because they feel love inside. They feel love and light inside, so they're able to give it out. Wow. Wow. I once read somewhere, and I wish I were a, a, an excellent quoter when it came to knowing all the things that are stuffed away in my brain. Um, <laughs> but someone said, like, if you go, like, three or four whys deeper into a question, you'll start getting closer to the, the, the ground floor of what's going on. Like, um, you know, I'm sad about this. Well, why are you sad? And then why do you feel that way? And then why do you feel that way? And then the deeper you go, you kind of, you know, you understand oh, oh, that's the real reason. Absolutely, yeah. So that's, that's something, cool. that's my favorite part of therapy is getting to the root. You thought you came in because your sister betrayed you, but really it's that you were tired of feeling betrayed long before she did that. That was just an extension of, of something that you already felt because other people's behavior bothers us less if it doesn't trigger us in some way. So there's always a deeper reason, always. Ooh, there's, uh, I think in therapeutic spaces, they allow you to say, ouch, when you hear things I'm like, <laughs> and you're like, you're like, that's not them. That's you. That's yeah. you. Absolutely. And are you requiring your, your clients to take uh, constant responsibility for th themselves and their behaviors? Is that, is that part of, do you, do you have a tough love approach or a? No, I have a very, um, we call it unconditional positive regard. So I'm always going to make it safe for you to express your feelings, no matter how shameful you may think they are. So like one of the processes is helping a person feel safe to share very, very, what they may feel are disturbing. There's no judgment here, but disturbing feelings or shameful feelings or, you know, just we have a tendency to judge ourselves. So making them feel safe to express it. Then the next step is showing them how you are not alone. Many people feel this way without, of course, disclosing the confidentiality of other people, but just in general. And then the last stage is helping you understand why you really feel that way. Because then once you have that understanding, you can begin to forgive yourself. You can begin to have empathy for yourself and those that hurt you. I'm not saying that you have to reconnect with anyone, but it's just a, a process like a, circular process, you know, where you go from telling it to understanding it to healing it. Mm, mm, so good. What do you do personally when you feel stuck in your life? Like if you, if it's a Friday morning and you yeah. just don't want to like get out of bed, because we, we all have those moments where it's kind of like, oh God, I'm so tired. Yeah. How, how do you help yourself personally get unstuck? I have to go to therapy just like everybody else. We mm. all should go to therapy. And I think maybe artists feel this way too. Like a lot of art, I think, speaks to people and heals people. And sometimes when you feel like you're a healer yourself or you're giving back yourself, then you've got to be so strong for everybody. But you cannot pour from an empty cup. Anybody Come on. Who me knows that I am always preaching, you cannot pour from an empty cup. So I will be the first to say, therapists go to therapy. Doctors go to a doctor. You can't perform surgery on yourself. Right, so, right. You know, you know, therapy or, or tapping into the, the very coping skills that I teach and uh, cultivate with my clients. You got to practice what you preach. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, what are you currently working on? Are you currently working on private clients? Are you just seeing people that are currently under your care? Um, and I know that I found you on Facebook. So what, what's going on right now in that space? Yeah. 
So right now I just have a couple of people that I see because I also have a full-time job where I also have a caseload um, doing more telephonic counseling. Um, so I'm in the process of transitioning into doing more, more private practice in a full-time manner. Transitioning. That's exciting. Yeah. That's exciting. That's exciting. We cannot wait to connect <laughs> our people with your people. I already got some ideas that I'll tell you about after the interview. Okay. Uh, Cause it's like this, everybody's prospered in 2019. Oh yeah. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Um, if you had to take, this is this, I've never asked this question before, mm -hmm. but if you had to take the faces or the collective face of artists into your hands and look them right into the eyes and say something, what would you say? Mm, that's a good one. Let me visualize this because visualization is an important part of uh, mental health as well. So just all the artists, you know, I find myself thinking dancers, painters, uh, people who draw, videographers. And I would say, you know, don't get lost. You, you pour so much of yourself into your art, like 100%. And you pour so much of yourself into it, but you also, if you're an actor or something, take so much of it on. You become that character. I heard Michael B. Jordan say he went to therapy after playing Killmonger. I know what happened with um, Heath Ledger and everything after playing the Joker. And there's actually... I would suggest that all artists read this, this philosophy book by Albert Camus. He talks about the uh, absurdities of life. And one of the absurdities that I thought I found so fascinating was him talking about being an actor, but I think all artists could relate. Sometimes you become so engulfed because you're so passionate about your art that you, kinda, you can lose yourself and you know depression or anxiety or just uncertainty of wait who was i before i became said character can creep in so just being able to learn grounding techniques for staying true to who you are maybe if you've been playing killmonger all week journal as michael b jordan every night to stay in tune with who you are journal about how michael b jordan feels about killmonger to keep the two separate right yeah. So if you have terrible feelings about Killmonger and you fear that that's going to get in the way of your work, it won't. What will get in the way of your work is if you allow this person to infiltrate you just completely and then you lose yourself afterwards. Right. Not being able to pour from an empty cup for your next gig. Right. Right. And I mean, it's so mission critical that we stay grounded yes. along the path and grounded in our work. Yeah. I want to thank you so much for your pouring out. Your cup is clearly not empty up in here. <laughs> um, you got tons of water and I'm juice. Go off a day. You got juice. You got you know. You got all the things. Salsa. You know. <laughs> oh, God. I'm so grateful. I always end um, these episodes with the same three fill in the blanks for those who share with us. And so here are your three. Okay. Okay. And thank you, thank you again for like being here. This is so good, so good. All right, love is. Love is an action word. It's an action word. It's not just a feeling. We think it's a feeling, but it's an it's an act. It's something you do. Wow! Wow! Joy is. Joy is. A part of every day, if you can find it. A every part of every day. Wow! 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 Freedom is mental. It's mental. I, I, that's a whole nother episode. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wow! Freedom is mental. Yeah. Wow. Okay. We got to, okay. I'll just keep you for 30 seconds more because we got to talk about like, when you said that, I immediately thought about those uh, elephants that are chained to like the little stick, not knowing its power. Have you seen that, that analogy? 
No, but it's a powerful one. I, I think I have. It sounds it, vaguely familiar. There's but. like a picture of like, and they say that if you chain an elephant to like a little steak when it's a baby elephant, it, yeah. it pathologizes that that steak is going to keep me there. So no matter how big the elephant gets, it will still stay there because its mental state is not free. Absolutely. Yeah. That's exactly what I mean. That is a visualization of exactly what I mean. Freedom is mental. And this is not to discredit anyone who's been enslaved or anyone who's been, you know, captured because people can mess with your mental to make you feel like you are enslaved, which still goes back to it's mental. Wow. wow. Yeah. Well, thank you for setting us free today. Like, <laughs> that is just so good. Thank, thank you, you for so setting much. me free, for allowing me this opportunity to share with you. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs>